Well, I've shared with you quite a bit now on the problems of CPR performance and difficulties with CPR quality. Well, I also showed you that we can record CPR using certain defibrillators that allow such recording. Our group and other groups have shown that using these CPR defibrillators, you can actually give feedback to rescuers and improve quality. These defibrillators actually can give real-time feedback, so uh, you can actually look at the video screen on the defibrillator and see your rate, see your depth, and this sort of fits into a schematic where you might imagine we deliver CPR, we record CPR, we give feedback, and then we do it again, and this is a cyclic process by which you could improve care over time. Well, one of the other ways we might consider improving care that's uh, very much a current discussion in many hospitals and EMS settings is can we use debriefing? After all, if we're going to record CPR, which I would argue all hospitals and EMS agencies should really consider doing, if we're going to record CPR, we could use that information to train people and say, well, gee, you know, you, you did CPR, here is your CPR, let's talk about how you could do it better. Well, we tested this model in the hospital setting where we took teams of physicians that provided CPR and debriefed them on their own cardiac arrest events, meaning we'd sit them down and say, you guys worked this cardiac arrest or provided CPR, and we want to show you what you did and talk about ways we can improve. And what we found was when you do this, you actually can improve outcomes. So in that third column, Feedback Plus, the CPR is giving, the, the defibrillator rather, is giving CPR feedback, and we're doing debriefing. And this is the rate of ROSC, or return of spontaneous circulation, in this group, which is much higher than a baseline or when we turn on the feedback defibrillators. So debriefing plus CPR feedback improved survival in this study. We've studied this in the simulation laboratory. A fellow working with me, Dr. Jessica Dine, has done important work on this, as have other groups. The point being that there's a lot of ways we can improve the culture of resuscitation, both for pre-hospital providers and hospital providers. Now, to set some context for this, you might wonder why I'm being such a CPR zealot. Those of you who are expert providers know that, well, there's medications and epinephrine and other drugs that we give during cardiac arrest, and isn't that more important? To, we call it advanced cardiac life support. Shouldn't it be more important than basic life support, which is CPR? Well, funny that you should ask that question. ACLS, which is the standard model for care as given by most advanced healthcare providers in the hospital and pre-hospital environment, does indeed use these drugs. Um, and indeed, the American Heart Association guidelines say for all cases of cardiac arrest, providers should give epinephrine every three to five minutes during a cardiac arrest event. So you might say epinephrine must be really important, right? Maybe it's more important than CPR. Well, that's epinephrine. Those of you who are not healthcare providers should know when I say epinephrine, you may think adrenaline. They're the same thing. Those are synonyms. Adrenaline is the more publicly known term. This is a natural hormone made by your body that's sort of a fight or flight response. It gives you great amounts of energy, dilates your pupils, makes your heart beat faster. You release this every time you sit down for an exam at school or every time you have a near-miss driving. Uh, if, if someone swerves into your lane, you release epinephrine. So it's a well-known, well-studied molecule that has dramatic effects. But you should know this. A really well-done randomized controlled trial out of Norway looked at whether or not epinephrine improved outcomes in cardiac arrest. Now, those of you who are healthcare providers may say, why is this get studied in 2009? We've been giving epinephrine for decades. Well, sometimes we have to go back and look at what we believe to be true to see if it really is true. And believe it or not, epinephrine had never been studied in a randomized placebo-controlled trial until 2009. It was studied in paramedic ambulance settings in Norway. Half the patients got standard care with epinephrine being given during cardiac arrest, and half did not. They did not get any epinephrine. They only got CPR. Well, surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, epinephrine did not improve survival at all. Whether or not the paramedics gave epinephrine did not affect survival to hospital discharge. Now, I'm not suggesting you don't give epinephrine. There's some reasons why it may be good. It is still part of the guidelines. But this is just to set the context that the medications we all as physicians and ACLS paramedics believe to be so important, they may not be as important as the basic fundamentals of doing good CPR. The evidence supporting good CPR is much greater than the evidence supporting any of these drugs that we call advanced cardiac life support. Now, in a lecture on CPR, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the new devices coming out to deliver CPR manually, uh, sorry, mechanically, rather. 
I shared with you the manual CPR support devices, and these are two such devices that allow you to monitor and deliver CPR. There are mechanical devices as well where you put the patient in these devices and you hit a button and the machine provides the CPR. Therefore, it might be perfect, right? No, no human required. Well, I'm going to share with you some data on one of these to show you that it's a bit more complex than that. This is a device called the Autopulse device, and again, full disclosures, I've received no uh, funding from Autopulse, and I have no equity or intellectual property in any of these devices. This was a study done using the Autopulse device in Richmond, Virginia. Paramedics were given these devices, and resuscitation care outcomes were recorded both in a period of time before they had the device, or when they were doing manual CPR, versus after they got the device, or when they used Autopulse. And they found that survival to hospital discharge tripled when they used the Autopulse device, suggesting that Autopulse may have provided great CPR and may have saved many more lives in the city of Richmond. Now, that sounds fantastic, right? This is a randomized controlled trial in five cities that looked at the same thing, manual CPR versus Autopulse CPR. And what did they find? They found that survival was the same, and if anything, you see they're lower in the Autopulse study. Statistically, I'll tell you it's not lower. It's, it's sort of a wash. It wasn't clear whether manual CPR or Autopulse were any better. I share with you this just to show you the complexity of clinical research, that you can have several studies looking at the same question, finding different results. Why is that? Well, the devil's in the details. The way you design the study, the way you train people to use these new devices, the way you record your data. Suffice it to say that in the year 2012, we don't know for sure whether mechanical CPR devices are good in all situations with all providers. It's an area of great interest. Many ambulance systems and even hospitals are starting to use mechanical CPR devices, and we'll learn much more about this, I believe, in coming years. Now, I talk a lot about lay people CPR in terms of not using breaths. Can we use similar techniques for professional rescuers? This question was asked by a colleague of mine, Dr. Ben Bobro in Arizona. He convinced his paramedics to not give rescue breaths.